On behalf of Tato and Ninja, Tato and Progressive Ninja, I would like to welcome all of you tonight to our Taskira by our brother Shi Said Mohamed Kuto. Um, this is one of the activities we organized by PNP. And uh, welcome to all those uh, new to our organization. And uh, I hope you will follow us through the Facebook and our to the WhatsApp posting that we do every time we have some activities. And we have our register and indoor. So if you uh, are not yet um, in our list, please do so, so that you will be informed of all our activities. So our talk tonight will be the talk on the title, Our Journey, Origin and Destination. Uh, Alhamdulillah, tonight's uh, uh, Taskira will be recorded so you can follow the Taskira live on Page Us Page, oh sorry, yeah. Page Us TV okay. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass the mic to Shri Muhammad Thank you, Mr. I praise Allah Almighty and I send prayers and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad his noble family, righteous companions, and all those that follow him with right guidance until the day of judgment. Is this okay? Uh, keeping the mic around here? It's alright? Okay. Glory be to you, O Allah, no knowledge have we except that which you have taught us. Indeed, you are the all knowing, the wise. <coughs> I apologize if something happens with the mic I'm trying to keep it at the ideal volume the ideal proximity so how is everyone today? Alhamdulillah, mashallah my name is Muhammad Qutub I am uh, originally from Syria uh, but by citizenship I, I am American, I lived in several places, I lived in Kuwait, I lived in the US when I was studying and I've been in Malaysia for the last six years doing my postgraduate studies. I did my uh, masters in usul al and comparative religion and now I'm doing my PhD or more accurately I'm not doing my PhD because I'm busy with <laughs> such as this one <laughs> I need to be doing more with my PhD inshallah it's great to meet all of you I'm very happy to be here and I uh, thank PMP that's the correct acronym for giving me this opportunity this is my debut at this center I ask that uh, your efforts are rewarded blessed and uh, that you will benefit many many people inshallah so we're here to talk about our journey and this is a journey that all of us are actually on it's a journey that every human being takes but quite interestingly there seem to be differences of opinion about where the origin is and where the destination is. So imagine yourself on a plane, right? And you're sitting next to the, the other passenger and you say, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to Venezuela. And the other guy says, oh, funny, I'm going to Singapore. So how are these two people sitting on the same plane going to different people, uh, places? You may say, well, transit. Somebody is transiting and there's a final destination. But no, there is no transit on this airplane. This airplane is going to one place, but how are the people on this plane differing over where they're going? This is to put it in simple terms. But to a large extent, if you look at our life, it's a journey. There's an origin and there's a destination. Interestingly enough, we all share this origin. So we're all coming out of the same country. And this country was called Earth. Because we all came from Earth. Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that 
all human beings are the children of Adam. We're all the children of Adam, the first prophet, the first human being, for that matter. Right? Uh, and Adam was made and created from? From the soil, from the earth, right? Like, Allah Most High says in the Quran, in an interesting, very succinct verse that summarizes this life and this journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَ أَعْوَدُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى That's the journey. Origin and destination. Lecture finished. We can all go home. مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ from it, we created you. From it, it being a pronoun referring to the earth, the soil. Minha khalaqnakum. Wa fiha nu'idukum. And in it, we will return you. Right? That's death. And from it, we will extract you once again. For what? Why are we being extracted? For the real life. The real life. This is not the real life. It seems real. It seems that this uh, speaker in front of you is speaking. Which he is, by the way. But is this the real life? Again, we think so because it's all we experienced. Right? But if we see the hereafter, believe me, you will forget there was anything ever called PMP or Malaysia for that matter, okay? Or anything you did in this life because we will be... things with open eyes that we are not able to blink because there are things that are we have never experienced and we would have never thought imaginable and this is why and this is the meaning of the verse that we will extract you once again because you will be resurrected for the afterlife and in the afterlife my brothers and sisters there are only two places there is a third, but it's not really an abode, okay? It's just a very temporary place before then going to the permanent abode. And what's that temporary place, brothers and sisters, students of knowledge? Yes, in judgment? No, not really. What's the temporary? Barzakh is before the Qiyamah. Barzakh is when you and I die, right? This is why when, when some of the companions were asking Prophet Muhammad, Oh, Prophet of Allah, when is the day of judgment? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, looked at a, a little child and he said, When he dies, that will be the day of judgment. And what he meant by that, is that instead of asking about the ultimate day of judgment where everyone rises for accountability before their Lord, you should be thinking about your own personal day of judgment, which is your own death. Because at that point, you, are, you don't, no longer have the opportunity to do good. That's it. That's the barzakh. You already transitioned from this temporary life to the life of the grave. That's the barzakh, right? And at that point, even if, you know, you were biting your fingers in regret that you didn't do what you wanted to do in this life, that you didn't follow the path of God you should, the, the way you should, it's too late. So for all practical purposes, that's 
your day of judgment and mine when we breathe our last but the ultimate day of judgment yes there is something like a third place it's not an abode so I'll leave it there as a trick question or as homework for which you can answer inshallah maybe after the, the talk but ultimately there are only two places Fariqun fil Jannah wa Fariqun fil Sa'ir a group is in paradise and a group is in hellfire. We ask Allah to make us of the people of paradise and to protect us from hellfire. So, in this situation, our origin is all the same. We all started in the same way. Doesn't matter if you were born in Malaysia or I was born in the US or they were born in Europe or France or Africa or anywhere else. Ultimately, the origin the ultimate origin is this soil, this earth. And to it we will be returned and from it we will be extracted and resurrected to meet our maker subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the origin is known, but we seem to differ as human beings about the destination. For many people, the destination is unknown. <laughs> They're on a plane to nowhere. Where are you going? No idea. Where is this plane headed? Where is it going to land? No idea. The fuel is eventually going to be over. You have to do something about it. Whatever. I don't know. Some of the, the, the frequent responses. I don't know where I'm going. It doesn't matter where I'm going. I have no idea if I'm going anywhere in the first place. Another response is, I'm not going anywhere, I'm just going back to the earth. And then I'm buried and it's finished. And there's nothing else. That person is going to find a very rude awakening. A very rude awakening. When they are resurrected after having thought that the soil is the last thing, the last medium that they are going to see. That is not the case. When we talk about the afterlife, Sometimes uh, it can be a little bit difficult to fathom or imagine. And this is why, as we see, the Quran is filled with details about the afterlife. Okay, whether it is paradise or hellfire, and where people are going afterwards, what the ultimate destination is. When we're living this life, we say, this is the real life and there is nothing else, or seemingly so. So I'm going to give you a small example, and I hope it clarifies it somewhat. Another environment that we shared is our mother's belly. More precisely, the amniotic fluid. That's what it's called, right? So we were all in that environment before. And we were there for a long time. We're talking about nine months, maybe some people premature a little bit earlier, something along the lines of nine months. For nine months, our world, our world is what? My mother's belly. That's my world. We're, had you been able to connect a microphone and tell me, by the way, there's a lot more coming <laughs> your way. <laughs> I would have been like, you're insane. This is my world. I'm just, I'm swimming in this water. There's nothing else. And I'm eating and drinking. This is my life. So you're telling me I'm going out to something more? A whole world with a sun and a moon and planets and oceans and mountains and stars and other human beings and all kinds of things. Oh, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. This is my life. But when you come out, you see how limited your thinking really was. It's exactly the same. So you and I are thinking now, I mean, what more? This is life. There's nothing more. There's so much more. It's the same example. 
It's just a little bit hard to comprehend because there you're not exactly thinking, you're not exactly intellectual quite yet. Here you are. There's so much more. Our God has told us there's so much more. To the extent that your whole life, just like you know people's whole life flashes in front of them right when they're about to die, your whole life will just flash by in an instant in the afterlife. It will be just like a day. People will be talking to each other and saying, oh yeah, remember when we were in that life? It was like just a day had passed. It seemed so short, subhanAllah. When we're there, then we'll be able to talk this way. That takes faith. And this is what the Quran is establishing that you human beings are not here temporarily. You're, sorry, you're not here permanently, right? This is just a very temporary abode, just like the nine months was a temporary abode. And this is why Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would tell the companions, be in this life as if you are a stranger or someone in passing. So for all practical purposes, my brothers and sisters, this life is merely a transit point. You are in transit. This is not the destination. It seems like it's the destination because it seems quite long. But now imagine someone traveling and they are in transit and suddenly the two hours of transit become two days. There's a, there's a malfunction on the airplane. There's bad weather. You're gonna have to be here for two days. So now this guy does what? What Tom Hanks did in the terminal, if you have seen the terminal, he makes the airport his home. Can you imagine that? So you're there, you're thinking to yourself, two days, sheesh. When am I gonna get home? I'll start building my own little house here at the airport. People will say, you are insane. It's just a few days and then you're going to go on. This is just a transit point. Because we haven't experienced the afterlife, we don't necessarily see it that way. But once we do, we would say to ourselves, oh my God, this life was just a transit point and I was living in it as if it is the end all. It is the ultimate destination. Can we have the verses of Surah Abasa, brother? Abasa, yes. These verses of the Quran also summarize that journey in a beautiful way. Okay? I believe it's just six short verses starting from the origin and going to the destination. You got it, brother? I thought you tagged it. <laughs> so, let us try to agree, at least, that the destination is not this life, but rather an afterlife, that we are all meant to experience, but possibly in different ways, definitely in different ways. The destination we go to is based on what we do here in this life. And that clarity of purpose and clarity of origin and destination is what's going to make a difference in our lives here in transit. If you want to live a good life here, you need to have a clear purpose. You need to know where you came from and where you're going. For many Muslims, this seems to be a very simple matter that we take for granted. Believe me, we take for granted. Because we feel we have the answer. It's quite simple. Maybe also proponents of other religions feel the same. But for people who do not have that answer, it can be extremely unnerving. And extremely uh, difficult to deal with. And it can even be a destroyer of lives, as we will see. Got the verses, brother? Can you just project them? 
So our brother here has uh, his own invention, it seems. A nice little projector inside the phone. So afterwards, he's going to give us his secret how to make, turn our phones into portable projectors. Right? Can you make it larger? Without the audio. Yeah. The projector is he's still working on it. You know? <laughs> Improving the... Can you make it clear? I don't think it's clear. Can you make it clear? Can you make it larger or is that the largest? Oh. Okay, so... Go back. No, no, go back. Go back. Oh, oh. Can you stop the audio, brother? Okay, show us the verses now. Is it clear or is it still blurry? It's still because It's blurry? Okay, if we turn it off. Now? I have to go nearer. Okay, come nearer. No problem. Please do. All right. Oh, but then it's going to be smaller. It's going to be smaller. Oh, no. Okay. Okay, go up. Okay, so it's really small. I'm going to read it to you. Go up, brother. Go up, go up, go up, go up, 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 up. Okay, up, up, up. All right. Yes. So, قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَهُ God Almighty says, Ah, oh, you don't have the translation, so I'm going to have to translate it myself. Yeah, easy translation. The, the, the app needs work, brother. <laughs> it's in Malay. How many people speak Malay? Almost everyone? Am I the only exception? No? So, قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَ Allah is saying, cursed is the human being. How disbelieving he is. How disbelieving he is. Who does this apply to? It applies to the people who have disbelieved in God, who disbelieve in the afterlife, who claim there is nothing but this life that we are living and we will not be resurrected. So Allah is saying, how, can these, how are these people thinking? How are they even... Uh, yeah, brother? Okay, so... قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَ Cursed is the human, how disbelieving he is. Obviously, it doesn't apply to those who believe. But there are those who think that, or by just saying that God doesn't exist, that God will stop existing. Or that by insulting God, God forbid, that God will somehow disappear. Or to even use phrases, excuse me for the very audacious term, things like God is dead, God forbid, right? They use these types of terms. To those, Allah says, cursed is the human being, how disbelieving they are. Right? No, it's better. Yeah, but it's in Arabic. I yes. wanted the English, I wanted them to read it. But that's okay, I'll, I'll translate it. You're just gonna have to trust me. Right? <laughs> I'll, sh I'll show you the, the verses later in English, or maybe if there's an English Quran, that uh, someone wants to read. Okay, so Allah is saying, cursed is the human being. Okay, how disbelieving he is. You got the, the translation now, brother? Yep. Okay, mashallah. Go down, go down, go down, go down. Down, down, down. Down, down, down. Down, down, down. Okay, one minute. Okay, go down, go down. More, 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 more. More, 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 more. More. More, more, okay, I think that, okay, all right, how ungrateful he is, how ungrateful the human being is, okay, go, go, go down now, okay, go down, yes, from what thing did he create him, how were you and me created, yes, ultimately we are from soil, this is portable, uh, but ultimately, that's ultimately, Adam, peace be upon it, was created from the soil. And ultimately, our origin is soil, from the sand, from the earth. But more directly, coming from our parents, we came from what? Sperm. A drop of sperm, right? From what thing did he create him? From a nutfa. More accurately and scientifically, all right, it's... The, the mixture 
obviously, of the male and the female fluid. So we might not call it sperm in that case. We call it nutfa. The nutfa, right? That drop, we all came from that drop, right? And then we want to spread our wings and say, there is no God, and I am this, and I am that, and you came from, come down, brother, and you came from this. Something that usually would possibly repulse people, all right? This is what you came from. And now here you are challenging God, right? And you are just a speck, a speck in this whole universe. And you are challenging God Almighty. You were created from this. He created him and then said to him, in due proportion. Did you create yourself, brother? Did you, excuse me, did you choose to be black? No. Did you choose to be white? No. Did you choose to be a man? No. Did you choose to be a woman? Nobody chose anything. Okay? Allah set you in due proportion and created you in this beautiful way. Next. Then he makes the path easy for him. Thumma sabila yassa. He made the path easy. Meaning, he showed you how to live. He showed you what's right and what's wrong. He showed you the the right path to take. ثم السبيل يسرى. Next. Then he causes him to die. This is the journey. Did you live your life according to the path that Allah showed you? Did you see the path? Is the path clear to you? Are you searching for that path? If you are, ask God Almighty. He will show you the path. Come back, brother. No, it's good. What did you do? Okay. Experimenting? Yep. Go back. Experiment in the lab, brother. Now we're in the top. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh, all right. now. <laughs> okay. No, go down, go down, go down. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. All right. Go up a little bit. So he. After he made the path easy for him, then he causes him to die. Then he causes him to die and puts him in his grave. We're all going there. Next. Then, when it is his will, he will resurrect him again. The destination. We will all be resurrected and we will meet Allah. Next. Nay, but man has not done what he commanded him. Unfortunately, this is this is the story. It's a little bit of a sad story because we wish everyone followed the path, but many people are not. Right? So Allah says, Nay. Man has not done what he commanded him. And even if we take this to apply to us as Muslims, and I think I'm following the path, I think I'm following the way that Allah wants me to follow, but was I able to do so precisely as he requires and as is due of his magnificence and what he's due of worship? Not even close, right? None of us have given Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his due rights. Okay? Because the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so great. Because Allah is so merciful that he keeps me alive even though I continue to sin. And yet he provides for me. And yet he guides me and he gives me. Even those who disbelieve in him. Even those who disbelieve in him. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, لا أحد أصبر على أذن يسمعه من الله عز وجل إنه يشرك به ويجعل له الولد ثم هو يعافيه ويرزقه الله أكبر. So the Prophet ﷺ said, No one is more patient 
with verbal abuse that they hear other than Allah. Why? Because they disbelieve in him and they associate partners with him and they claim that he has uh, uh, sons and daughters and so on. And yet, despite that, he gives them health and he provides for them. If it was anyone else, that would be a totally different story. Sure. My brothers and sisters, when we talk about the purpose of life, people have defined it in different ways. What's your purpose? Why are you here? What is the most frequent reply to what's your purpose in life? Maybe a frequent reply that you would hear is, I'm here to make a living. I'm here for money. I'm here for what? For fame, for popularity. I'm here to eat and drink and reproduce. Believe it or not, a lot of people's lives reflect that this is their grand purpose. To eat, to drink, and to reproduce. All right? Precisely, excuse me for the expression, as the animals do. They eat, they drink, and they reproduce. So if a human being's purpose is restricted by that, then we are no different than the animals. Why do we have a superior intellect? Why did Allah grant me all these faculties that he didn't grant the animals? Because I need to go beyond this. I need to go above this, right? Maybe a common purpose we can say for everyone is happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. I don't think anyone wants to be sad. Unless you're an emo, right? I think they like sadness. But otherwise, for all practical purposes, human beings like happiness. But how do we define happiness? People define happiness in different ways. How do you define happiness, brother? What's happiness to you? Being able to fulfill. Maybe it requires some thinking. What's happiness to you? Being able to follow what's, what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, mashallah. So the brother is thinking about his afterlife. He's not only thinking about this worldly life. What's happiness to you, brothers, sisters? Tell me. Okay, so I don't which one? To care for others. To care for others. MashaAllah. A, a noble goal. A noble aim. Absolutely. What else? Happiness. By the way, a lot of people find happiness in that. Even though they have so much wealth, in the end, it's just like a toy and eventually you get bored of it. But they find true happiness in doing something good and helping others. And this is why very early on, one of the first few chapters that the Qur'an, uh, when the Qur'an was revealed, the Qur'an started talking about who? A class of society that is very much in need of care. The orphan. Right? As in Surah Al-Duha, one of the very early chapters. And there and early on, Allah is telling Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, do not oppress or be unjust towards the orphan. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, lived as an orphan, as we all know. Okay, what else? Happiness. Brothers and sisters, come on, give me the, give me the usual answers, right? <laughs> to, to <be> Makanan, <laughs> money, houses, you know, cars. They can answer you there. Uh, one, one, uh, one of my students, He's, I think, about 11 or 12 years old. So he wrote me a small paragraph, his, uh, his hopes and dreams, right? Uh, I'm teaching him Arabic and stuff, but uh, interestingly, he was honest enough to say his dream is to become a successful businessman with a lot of money, he wants to have fancy cars and this and that. I said, okay, fine, uh, everyone, you know, likes that. But, you know, are there other things you, you want as well? But to a lot of people, that's it, right? Yes. This is happiness, or at least they think this is happiness, right? Can I have other answers? Happiness. How might we define happiness? Contentment. Contentment, oh yes. 
excellent answer, barakallah feek. Contentment. Because you know why that's an excellent answer? Why? Tell me why that's an excellent answer. Satisfaction. Well, I think what? Satisfaction. Because whether you are poor or rich, uh -huh. alhamdulillah. No matter what you have or don't have, you're content. You're satisfied. This is paradise in your heart to be content. And this is one of the greatest gifts that Allah gives to people. So you might have found people in life having much less than you and I, being deprived of certain blessings that maybe you and I enjoy, yet they're content. SubhanAllah, what a blessing. And while others have everything that human beings want to have, they're still not satisfied. They're still not content. It's like they're running around their tail and they can't seem to get it. Right? They're just going around in circles. Though they have so much, Prophet Muhammad said, if the child of Adam, the human being, were to have two valleys full of gold, what would he seek? The third valley full of gold. Precisely. We'll never be satisfied. Unless you have this gift of being content. I'm happy with what I have. Sometimes it might surprise us. Brother, how are you happy? I mean, look at your situation. You don't have this, you don't have that. He says, Alhamdulillah. Praise be to God. I'm happy with what I have. I'm content. This is paradise on earth. This is paradise on earth. What else? Happiness. Tell me. I didn't even take my sip yet. <laughs> she gave a, a, a good answer. I had to comment. What is happiness? Tell you what. What's misery? What's misery? Sickness. Huh? Sickness. Sickness can be very miserable. Absolutely. Especially if it's chronic. May Allah protect us all. What else? Poverty? Absolutely. There's an Arabic saying, I don't know if you've heard it, uh, that starvation or hunger is disbelief. Almost saying that it's, it's so potent, poverty, that it can lead you to the worst things. It can lead you to disbelief, it can lead you to crime, it can lead you to anything, right? People will do anything when they are hungry, when they are poor or needy. What else? Misery. And not so, absolutely, blindness, alhamdulillah, for, for Allah's blessing. A not so obvious answer. Misery is, when you don't is the lack of purpose. The lack of purpose. And you only know that misery if you experienced it. If you didn't, maybe you're not quite sure what I'm talking about. But for a person who experienced it, they became so miserable, it even led to suicide. Can you imagine? What for? Maybe they had a good life. But they took their own life. Why? It's difficult to understand. Because you didn't experience that misery that they experienced. And that misery that they experienced is lack of purpose. Not knowing where they're going. Not knowing why they're here in the first place. Not knowing what they're doing. And not knowing where they were going to end up. So though they may have enjoyed much of what life had to offer, they figured this life is not worth living. Can you imagine that? Someone taking their own life because of lack of purpose. Not because of poverty, not because of chronic illness, not because of blindness. They might have been the richest of the rich, 
the most popular of the famous people, and yet they took their own life. How? Why? You don't know the misery they were experiencing through their artificial smiles. In their heart was a misery only they knew about to the extent that departing this life was easier than remaining in it. Can you imagine that? And there are examples, many examples, of the richest of the rich, the most famous of the famous, okay. and they took their own lives. Yes? Uh, some years ago, there was a, uh, a lady from, I believe it was Central Asia, that area, a very beautiful lady, so beautiful that she was entering beauty pageants one after another. She wasn't old, she was a young girl. She entered one pageant after another and she was winning. She was becoming popular. Everyone was pointing their fingers at her, look at her, look at how beautiful, look at what she has achieved, right? Everyone wants to be around her. She's the one to be around now. She's making the, the headlines and the front covers of magazines. Wow, a dream come true for many of today's teenage girls and maybe even older. What, what more could she want? She had friends, she had admirers and fans, right? And then maybe there wasn't that much social media. If it was now, she would have been on cloud nine. Right? With a million followers or more. Right? One day, they find that she committed suicide. A real shocker. A real bummer. She was young and beautiful. SubhanAllah. But did she find that path? She took her own life. Why would she take her own life? She has finally reached the stage every woman wants to reach. This is Jannah for them. This is paradise, right? She achieved it. It seems that paradise was still not enough. There was still something missing here inside. There was a vacuum, a spiritual vacuum that she couldn't fill. Even after enjoying one pleasure after another. And she said, there is no pleasure I did not try. And of course, these are fleeting pleasures. These are actually, this is the path to regret, not the path, path to pleasure. But she says she tried everything. She's trying to be happy. But she couldn't find that happiness. Because that's not where happiness is to be found. Finally, of course people were shocked. They couldn't understand. Why at this time? Why this girl who's always smiling and very bubbly and has friends? And you would have never expected it. She would have been the last person you would have named to commit suicide. Until they found something that brought them closer to the answer. They found, I believe, possibly an email she sent, that she wrote, I'm so lost. SubhanAllah. She wouldn't have told you that herself. She kept that to herself. But she was saying it to one of her best friends. I'm so lost. And then she said, I don't know if I'll ever find myself. Can you believe it? I mean, look at the way she expressed it. She's looking for herself. She thought achieving all of this, she will find herself. She'll find her ultimate joy, right? What she's after. She's looking for something, but she doesn't know what. 
And when she achieved all of that and she's still not happy, that means this is the time to end my life. It's extremely shocking, especially when you consider this person was looking for herself. She's trying to find something, right? She's trying to find a sabil, thumma sabil yassar. Had she found that path, things may have been totally different. And then she, she would probably have forsaken all of those quote unquote fleeting pleasures for the ultimate pleasure in knowing her Lord and following the way that he had drawn for her. It becomes especially shocking when you think the last person who should commit suicide is an atheist or a disbeliever. Why? Because for us as Muslims, for all practical purposes, or many of us, the purpose is rather clear, right, brothers and sisters? In fact, that's why suicide is so low amongst Muslims. We know where we're going, we know where we came, we have the answers to these deep philosophical questions that plague some minds to that extent that they become miserable because they don't have the answer. And you and I, oh, it's, you know, my five-year-old can tell you why we're here and where we're going, right? But for other people, this is like the question of a lifetime, the question of the journey. Where am I going? Where, why am I here? What am I doing here? Right? So for a Muslim, for all practical purposes, it's quite clear. And... For a disbeliever, especially who doesn't believe there's an afterlife, who is saying, look, once I die, that's it. I'm not going anywhere else. Okay? For that type of person, this life, this world, is everything. Is it not? Because they don't have an afterlife. They don't have an akhirah. He's saying himself, once I die, I go to the soil and it's finished. Right? So for that person, this life is everything. And it is the most precious thing they have. Right? And yet, <coughs> they sacrifice the most precious thing they have. Everything. This life. That's what's even more shocking. So you might expect with that argument, just from a logical perspective, for a Muslim, for instance, he knows where he's going. He knows there's an afterlife. So he doesn't really care about this life. So he says, okay, let me take my own life. Just from a, a pure logical equation. The other person, this life is everything. Why would you take it? Why would you finish it? Aren't you supposed to live your life to the fullest? Do everything you ever want to do? do whatever it is as long as it pleases you then it is halal isn't that the philosophy for a lot of people right following their own vain desires my brothers and sisters slavery is real i'm not talking about chattel slavery i'm talking about slavery to things and people Every human being is a slave to something. You're either a slave to alcohol, sex, money, fame, all together, <laughs> right? All those things all together. Your own vain desires. Another human being. A tree that you worship or a star that you worship. Or you are a slave to the Almighty, the one and only God Almighty. There's no other God but He. So who would you rather be a slave of? Just choose. You're going to be a slave to something. Don't say you're not. Okay? If you claim you are free, 
you're not a man of religion, you have nothing to do with God and this and that. Guess what? That person is a slave to his own desires. He does whatever his brain tells him to do. Right? Or his uh, whatever his hormones tell him to do. Right? He's a slave for all practical purposes. So why don't you choose to be a slave of Allah? Because that is the only true freedom. Why? Because when you are a slave to all of those other things, all of those other things are not alive. And they are not after your welfare. But when you willingly make yourself a servant of the Almighty, you are making yourself a servant to someone who only desires your welfare and loves for you the best that there can be. So let us be servants of the Almighty. Let us not consider that this worldly life is everything. This worldly life is nothing. Can we see the, the verses of Surah Al-Hadid, brother? This worldly life, my dear brothers and sisters, is just temporary. It's fleeting. You know what? Some of the older prophets, peace be upon them all, for them, maybe not understand or not, not understanding, rather uh, seeing this world as temporary may have been more difficult than for us. Why? You got it, brother? Yeah, <laughs> no, I've changed. I've changed. Brother, the app needs to. No, this, 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 this now. This now. That's okay. Go to Hadith. Go to Hadith. Uh, this time we're here. No, brother, I'm just joking with you. Go to uh, Al Hadith. Okay? It's, uh, it's, it's in the middle. It's near the end. Okay? But, but, uh, yes, brother. Which one? I, we're going we're to put it for you right now. Just go. For those prophets, let's say Prophet Nuh How long did Prophet Noah live? You can say maybe a thousand plus, right? A thousand plus what? Months? Years. Years. Wow. A thousand plus years. For that person, it may be more difficult to see this life as temporary. He's living for a thousand. That's a long time. That's a millennium. Right? What yes. happens in a thousand years? Yeah. But for you and me, maximum 60, 70, 80. So what on earth are you living in this life as if it is eternity for? If you were new, living for a thousand years, okay, maybe you say, no, this life is everything, a thousand years. But you're only living 67 years and that's it? So it really is quite short, right? And by the way, you're not living, you're not actually living for 60 years. You know that, right? If you die at 70, you didn't live for 70, you lived for about 45 because you were sleeping for about 25. <laughs> right? You sleep for a third of your life, approximately, if, you get, if you're getting your eight hours of sleep, which I think most of us don't, right? So, it's really short when you think about it. And then when you compare it to eternity, 67 years compared to eternity. I understand there are people who live longer than 60. MashaAllah, I see some elderly people, people here. May Allah give you health and strength. Some people live beyond the 100. Yes, absolutely. And they live healthy lives. But for a lot of us, maybe 60, 70, and maybe less. Go down, brother. Go down. Go down. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and describes to us what this life ultimately is. Go down, go down. Keep going. Okay. Where are you now? Go down. Go down, go down, go down, go down. More, 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 more. Okay, down, 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 yes, down. Okay. Uh, uh, up here, this way. Yeah. Down? Or? Down, yeah. Down, my down. <laughs> The other way. The other way. No, 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 go back, go back, go back. Yeah. Go down this way, yes. Thank you. More, 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 more. 
Okay, here we are. Okay, more? All right. The English part? Verse 20? Can you see that? Yes, verse 20. Know that the life of this world is only these things. Play and amusement, pomp and mutual boasting among you and rivalry in respect of wealth and children. That's life. As the likeness of vegetation after rain, thereof the growth is pleasing to the tiller. Afterwards it dries up and you see it turning yellow. Then it becomes strong. So you see this vegetation when the rain comes down, grows beautifully. Then after a while, it just withers away and it goes with the wind. This is this fleeting temporary life. But in the hereafter, there is a severe torment for the disbelievers, evildoers. And there is forgiveness from Allah and His good pleasure for the believers, good doers. Whereas the life of this world is only a deceiving enjoyment. This is the worldly life, my dear brothers and sisters. Don't put all of your eggs in this basket. Leave something for the afterlife. Work for the afterlife. Live with a purpose. Okay? Do something because you will meet Allah. We will all meet Allah. And we will all speak to Allah directly. Allah will speak to us directly as He spoke to some of the prophets, not all. Who did Allah speak to directly of His prophets? Moses. Moses. And that's why He is called Kalimullah. Right? Moses. Allah spoke to him directly. And who else? Prophet Muhammad These two prophets Allah spoke to directly. The Prophet was spoken to directly in Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj. Can we play Al-Fatiha, brother? The audio? The following chapter you will hear is the opening chapter of the Qur'an, which we recite every day at least five times, sorry, at least 17 times in prayer, right? And possibly much more as well. Really quickly, the opening chapter of the Quran summarizes this purpose, this journey. Allah Most High says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the world. I don't presume to do tafsir of Surah Al Fatiha in five minutes when scholars have written volumes to explain the opening chapter, Al Fatiha. But I, I just want to go through it quickly. So we start in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Then we say, praise be to Allah, thanks to Allah, Lord of the world. We are thankful to Him for first bringing us here and of course providing us with all of the blessings that He continually does. Lord of the Alameen, the worlds, the worlds, the human beings, the jinn and all other worlds, all that exists. For, for, for all practical purposes. I'm not a multiverse proponent for you astrophysicists, you know, people who say it's not one universe, there's multiverse. No, there's no such thing as multiverse, but that's a different story. Go on, brother, next. The most beneficent 
the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is infinite and limitless. Next. The only owner and the only ruling judge of the day of judgment. So he is the owner of the day of judgment, a day we will all necessarily attend where Allah will hold us accountable for everything we have done. We ask Allah to be merciful towards us. Next. You alone, Allah, we worship. And you alone, we ask for help. This is the manifesto of a Muslim. You alone, Allah, we worship. And you alone, we seek for help. This is the, the sine qua non of Islamic, the Islamic creed, the Tawheed. We worship the one and only Allah. We associate no partners with Him. Next. And by the way, it's very simple. It's excruciatingly simple. Worship the one and only God. Why are human beings not doing so? Why are there a million different opinions about who God is and how He is to be worshipped? It's very simple. One and only Allah. And this was the message of all of the prophets in beautiful harmony. Next. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? 15? 15. You're very generous. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Guide us to the straight way. <coughs> so, I think I am guided, right? I think I'm on the path, but I keep repeating this. Lest I diverge, lest I digress, lest I get lost, lest I think I'm guided, but I'm, you know, I took a small detour, right? We always say, guide us to the straight way. And this is what we say to every human being searching for their Lord. If you're searching for the truth, Ask Allah of it. The one and only Allah. Not other gods. I was telling a, a friend, a colleague of another religion. And he admits, by the way, that he's worshipping other gods. But he admits also that in reality there's only one God. right? So I said, okay, therefore do me a favor. Get on your knees and even prostrate if you want and ask that one and only God you just told me about for guidance and he will guide you next uh, so we ask Allah for guidance to the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace not the way of those who earned your anger nor of those who went astray so this shows that even though there are people who think they're on the right path, they may not necessarily be on the right path. They may have uh, earned the anger of Allah or they went astray. So we always ask Allah to make us firm on the straight path. This is the opening chapter which we constantly recite in our daily prayers, right? In every unit of prayer. Can you show us the verses of Ali Amman? My brothers and sisters, you've all heard of the lunacy, the ludicrous claim that ah, this whole universe just came about by chance. You know, it could have not been. Some of these Great minds, astrophysicists, cosmic researchers, scholars. One, one of them gave this example. He said it's just like ice crystals on a window. You know the way the ice forms on the window? It could have, the crystal could have formed this way, could have formed this way. Just by chance, the whole universe came to existence. I mean, I think a child would laugh at such a claim, right? It's preposterous. 
to claim that all of this just came about by chance when the most minuscule of things you refuse to leave to chance, right? Would you leave to chance getting here to PMP? How did you get here, brother? Did you, did you come to PMP before? Yes. You came. Anyone who's, this is their first time? You're all regulars? First time, sister? How did you come here? Did you use GPS by any chance? No, my friend. Your friend knew. Why did you ask her? Why didn't you just get in the car and, ah, I'll find it? <laughs> by chance. You can, you, so you can't even find PMP by chance, but you want me to believe that this whole universe which contains billions upon billions upon billions, not only of stars, of galaxies, that they themselves contain billions of stars, right? And you want to tell me all of this just came about by chance. <coughs> and suddenly there's something called the human race. SubhanAllah. So what's the purpose of it all? According to these great minds. There is no purpose. Uh, we could have just not been here. And it just so happened that we are here. Oh well, can you believe that there are people who think this way? And they are quote unquote geniuses by the way. And that's why they will theorize this multiverse. Because then they will say, no, 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 it's not just us. Don't make us to be so special. There are multiverses. There are so many verses just like this one. Universes, right? So they call it the multiverse theory. Hogwash, baloney, multiverse. It's one universe. We are special. Allah created us for a purpose. And that purpose is to obey Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لَيَعْبُدُونَ This is the ultimate purpose. We did not create jinn and humanity except to worship me, to worship Allah. And worship here gives us the general meaning of worship, not the specific. The specific meaning of worship is prayer and standing and worshiping Allah, calling on Allah. No, here worship means to obey Allah. We are not expected to worship Allah 24 hours, nor are we capable of doing so. Right? But are we capable of living our life according to the tenets and precepts of the, the religion that he chose? Yes, absolutely. We can. And that is better for us. Not only in the afterlife. Here in this world as well. It's a win-win situation. Even if it was a lose-win situation, we should follow the commandments of Allah. Why? Let's say that the commandments of Allah dictated that you live a miserable life here. Hypothetically. Theoretically. Allah is saying, you must live a miserable life here and then I will give you the best of paradise in Akhirah for eternity. Right? It's a no-brainer. Even that one is a no-brainer. Okay. My, my, my God, I will live miserably in this life with the promise of paradise for eternity. Is that what Allah required? No. Allah only wants what good, what's good for us. Allah only commanded what is beneficial for us and only prohibited what is harmful to us. He wants us to live a good life here. A healthy life, a pure life, a clean life. And He wants to enter us into paradise for eternity in the afterlife. So it's a win-win situation. And what more, what do you expect anything else from the most merciful Allah? Allah will not tell you, be miserable so I can give you paradise. Allah is telling you, I only want what's good for you, here and there. The verses, brother, you got them? So, with regards to purpose, these types of people know their purpose. 
Did you get the, the verses or? Uh, ah, okay. Uh, this way, this way. Down. The other way, the other way. Okay, down and up is relative now. The other way, the other way. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Keep going. More, 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 more. I gave you the numbers, right? More, more. Well, one more, one more. Yeah, this page. Okay, now go down. Down, 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 down. Okay, I think that's enough. Uh, come back. No, come back, come back. Come back. More, more, more. More, more. Okay, a little bit more. Yeah. More, more. Thank you. Here, that one. There it is. All right. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. And Allah has power over all things. Next. Verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the alternation of night and day, there are indeed signs for men of understanding. Simply seeing the, uh, the staggering creation of the heavens and the earth, this universe, okay, with its remarkable vastitude, the alternation of the night and day, merely those things are signs for people who reflect. Much less the amazing miracle that is your own human body. When you look at your own human body, you are a walking miracle. All right? A walking miracle with billions of cells. Do we have biologists here? Just to make sure I get my numbers right. <laughs> so no problem. With billions of cells, each of which is literally a factory. This cell that you cannot see is a factory. It's a whole factory. If you studied biology, you would know. Uh, these, indeed, in these things are signs for people of understanding. Next. Those, who are those people of understanding? Those who remember Allah always. In all their different situations. When they're standing, when they're sitting, when they're lying down. How do they remember Allah? It's very simple. They just say the dhikr. Subhanallah, astaghfirullah, alhamdulillah. Whatever dhikr you say, you're, you're, you're magnifying your Lord, right? You're, you're, you're saying things, you're saying praise be to God, alhamdulillah. You know, so when you keep doing that, you're doing that in all of your different situations. These are the people who, have, who are people of understanding, people of reflection and think deeply about the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, our Lord, you have not created all this without purpose. These are the people of understanding. If he did not even graduate from primary school, and he believes this, he's smarter in my book than those other so-called geniuses who say, oh, no, 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 just just happened all like this. By the way, they understand the universe way better than you and me. Right? Yes. They can write mathematical equations about how the universe came about. So they know precisely that this is very far from being a chance event. Right? And yet they say that. Why? Because there's arrogance in their hearts. They don't want to admit that there's a higher power. But you know what? You know the beauty of it all? Is that they are being forced to admit now. Those same people, okay? The, 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 the Hawkings and the, uh, that other, uh, the, the Kikus and all of those types. Wallahi. They're being forced to admit now. Before, they were saying there's no God, period. Okay? Doesn't exist. But you know what they're discovering? The more they discover about the universe, the more they're discovering what is called the fine-tuning of the universe. Meaning, everything in this universe is so well fine-tuned to the most minuscule dimensions, they're coming to the conclusion, guys, this cannot be by chance. This is willful design. Someone designed this. You cannot 
have this, you know? Because they're, 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 they're looking at the different physical parameters in the universe. One parameter after another is so well fine-tuned, it's beyond being contingent upon chance. It's definitely designed. And then when you put it all together, so now you have so many of these parameters, each of which, if it was slightly different, life wouldn't be possible on earth. Allahu Akbar. The weight of the carbon atom, okay? Uh, the electromagnetic force, if it was a little bit different, all of these different parameters, if they weren't exactly right, you wouldn't have life on earth. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have a universe, period, much less a, much, a multiverse. So now they're being forced to say, there is a designer. They don't want to say it's Allah. That's another step. But they're, they're coming to this step, having to say, yes, intelligent design. This couldn't have come about except through some kind of design by a designer. Who that designer is and what he wants, I don't know right now, but I'm, I'm ready to admit that much, you know, to concur with that much, subhanAllah. So these people already know all of this couldn't have come about by chance, right? Or haphazardly. So they say what? Our Lord, you have not created all this without purpose. There must be a grand purpose behind all of it. And that's when things start to make sense. When there's a grand purpose. Glory to you. Exalted be you above all that they associate with you as partners. Give us salvation from the torment of the fire. People who reflect. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before he was 40, before he became 40 years old, he used to worship Allah in his own way, right? How? Reflection. When he would go out to the cave and just reflect upon this beautiful nature and realize that there's a God behind all of this. He wasn't quite sure yet how to worship him specifically as we know after he received the message. But he knew there's a God, one and only God. He's the only one worthy of worship. And he's the one who made all of this and he did so with purpose. Right? Yeah. This means two minutes or zero minutes. <laughs> okay, we're finishing the verse, just the verse. Next. Next, brother. Our Lord, verily, whom you admit to the fire, indeed you have disgraced him. And never will the Valimun, okay, the polytheists and wrongdoers, find any helpers. Next. Our Lord, see this is all part of their supplication. Our Lord, verily, we have heard the call of one, Muhammad calling to faith. Believe in your Lord, and we have believed. Our Lord, forgive us our sins, and remit from us our evil deeds, and make us die in the state of righteousness, along with al abrar those who are obedient to Allah and follow strictly His orders. Next. Beautiful dua, beautiful supplication by these people of intellect and reflection. Our Lord, grant us what you promised unto us through your messengers and disgrace us not on the day of resurrection for you never break your promise. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi. No, not yet. I think we're going to open it up to Q&A right now, yes? So we pass around the mic. They have their own mic? Okay, all right. So if there are any questions or comments, the floor is yours. Yes, brother. Uh, he said there was two, uh, the decimal is two places. Right. And then the third one? Ah. <laughs> he didn't forget. Brother, you didn't forget. Huh? Yeah, you never forget. <laughs> the third one is Al-A'raf. Al-A'raf 
uh, when they are waiting, they're waiting for judgment. And that in itself is kind of like a punishment, okay? Uh, may Allah protect us. But they're waiting for judgment and they continue to wait. So this is, and this is, the, this, the chapter is named after, Surah Al-A'raf. So, uh, for maybe some people will think of it kind of like a purgatory. That's not the case, okay? Purgatory, and purgatory for people who don't know, is uh, being punished in hell, okay? Almost like uh, as, as a temporary abode. Islamically, we believe that there are some people, including Muslims, okay, who were impious, all right, who did violate their Lord's commands, who will be punished in hellfire, but for a time, after which, God willing, they will be taken to paradise. So that's the closest parallel to what is known as purgatory. But Ashab al-Araf is something a little bit different. And, but in the end, it's only two abodes. Paradise or hellfire? We ask Allah for paradise and we seek His protection from hellfire. So, mashar is different. What's it, what is it? Mashar. Mashar? What's mashar? Mashar, you know. When I say anything like mashar, <coughs> before, <coughs> before, before the judgment. Barzakh. Barzakh? Mashar. 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 <laughs> again, again, this? No, I say you. After, after the race, after, race, after the the Barza. Race. Yes. They have been judged. Yes. That's, that's what they call Basha. Uh, Masha. In what language? Arabic. 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 Mahshar. Mahshar. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you're talking to an Arab. <laughs> Mahshar. Four letters. Mim, ha, shin, ra. Mahshar. Okay. Al Mahshar is, uh, yes, is on the day of judgment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will collect all human beings before the judgment. Okay? And. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us in the authentic report that Ardul Mahshar, the place where all people will be brought, is where? Ardul Mahshar wal Manshar. You gotta know this. Where is it? It Daha? Bilad Sham. Bilad Sham. The Levant. The Levant. That area is Ardul Mahshar. That's where all people will be. Collected before the final judgment. Allah Alam. There's something I've been asked about the UAE. Again, you again. Say that al Qarni. Al What about him? He he lived a very poor life, you know. And uh, they were saying, if uh, Allah wanted to give him good in this world, in this world and the hereafter, uh, in this world, why is it that he lived a very poor life? Okay, um, let's differentiate. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. All right, that was close. <laughs> so, that was close. Differentiate between two uh, two concepts: poverty and zuhd. They're different. Zuhd is the Arabic word meaning? Asceticism. Being an ascetic. An ascetic means you live your life not like everyone else who wants wealth and fame. You live a very poor life. Maybe you isolate yourself. You don't you know, participate or partake in the pleasures of this life. Whatever it is. Some uh, monks, okay, who choose uh, a celibacy. Maybe they choose to live kind of like an ascetic, okay? So, zuhd is different than poverty. But some people confuse them. I don't mean to say Uwais and Qani confused it. But some of the companions, okay, 
they were poor, but they were perfectly fine with it. They were content. They felt they had what they needed. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, what did he leave behind? His shield that he used to fight with, it was pawned. It was pawned with a Jewish merchant. Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't care about this worldly life, right? He was always thinking about an akhirah. So some of the companions may have been poor. Now, all of, practically all of them practiced zuhd. But zuhd does not mean be poor. So, Uthman ibn Affan, who is the Khalifa, which Khalifa in, in rank? Third Khalifa. By our standards, was? He was a millionaire. So was Uthman ibn Affan. Right? They were millionaires. So what did they bequeath? What did they leave? They didn't. They gave it all. They were philanthropists. They gave in charity. That's Zuhd. That's Zuhd. So Zuhd is actually a, a worship of the heart. It's not about being poor or rich. They were rich, maybe filthy rich. Did they live filthy rich? No. They lived like ascetics. You see their house, you see their car, their animal, their transport, to be precise. You would say, oh, this is a poor man. He doesn't have anything. You don't know what he has in the bank. That's Zuhd. So a lot of them, they seemed poor. They lived that way because they were ascetics, because they didn't care about the, 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 this worldly life. Doesn't necessarily mean they didn't have money. But they would spend it all in the way of Allah. Abu Bakr, how much did he spend in the way of Allah? All. all. He zeroed the balance. Can you imagine that? So here you have your, your I don't know where you put your money. Maybank. <laughs> <laughs> Any Maybanks here? Mu'amalat, Bank Islam, Hongkong. So then you tell the, the person, zero the account. What? Say that again. Zero. Where are you spending it? Charity. Are you insane? Are you alright? Are you, are you drunk? Abu Bakr radiallahu anh spent it all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar came and he spent 50% and he thought he was doing really well until Abu Bakr came and spent it all. So this is the way they lived. It's, it's, a, it's shocking. It's amazing. Subhanallah. So, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes. So, God says that He guides whom He wants and this guides whom He right. wants. And everything is predestined. Mm. So, some people might say that, oh, I'm, I'm lost because like, God predestined it. So, I'm not right. accepting yeah. So, how do you respond to that? Okay. I'll tell you how. Find out if they have a car, and then take a hammer or something and smash their car. <laughs> All right? No, really. I'm giving you the solution now. And then tell them, oh, it was predestined. And that's what God destined me to do. Yeah, man. <laughs> His claim is as ludicrous as yours. When you smashed his car and you said, I'm sorry, God destined me to do that. Do it. And they'll think differently. Because they'll say, what do you mean? You're the one who did it. Well, exactly. You're the one who is not following his commandments. You're the one who's choosing, just like I chose to hit your car, right? Even though I know that whatever happens in this world, as a Muslim, I believe, I have the creed, that whatever happens in this world, including of human actions, is predestined, okay, in that sense. 
in the sense that it was destined, not in the sense that Allah approves of it. You see what I'm saying? The difference between approval and destiny. And sometimes that's what confuses people. So we don't equate them. You show that, yes, it, there is predestination, but that's something a little bit beyond our comprehension. Your responsibility and mine is to act. So when I smashed your car, I did that out of my own free will, right? But if I told you it's predestination, that's essentially what you're saying. You are acting on your free will and then you're blaming it on destination, okay? On qadar. Another solution, ask them. When you went and you committed that grave sin, whatever it was, did you feel a magic hand pushing you towards committing that sin? Did you feel, you know, I don't know if any of you experienced a hurricane where the wind is blowing so hard you can't resist? Did you feel that? I think you will answer in the negative. So don't blame it on predestination. You are acting of your own free will. But as you do so, we understand that once it occurs, it was predestined. You see what I'm saying? But I like the, the, the car smashing idea. That's <laughs> <laughs> That'll immediately get them thinking. Excuse me. Yes, brother. Regarding uh, Surah, I, um, I, I say, uh, Adu on Shaitan, Adu on Mubin. Okay. In the Shaitan, Alakum Adu on Mubin? Okay. How to. Surah uh, Fatir. Maybe. Sorry. If that's what you're talking about. Yeah. The, the, the full verse yeah. actually is beautiful because that verse is talking to all of humanity. It says, Ya ayyuhan nas. He says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humanity. After saying, إِنَّ وَعَدَ اللَّهِ حَقْ فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمْ حَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ So he tells all of humanity, do not let the deceitful one deceive you. Meaning, the devil. Okay? And then he said, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ فَاتَّخِذُهُ عَدُوًا Okay, this is maybe a different verse, but uh, good just the same. إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ the shaitan is an enemy to you, right? And the shaitan is, what uh, we call him? What do we call shaitan? Call him Iblis, right? Others maybe know him as Lucifer. Shaitan is an enemy to you. Look at what Allah then says. Therefore, take him as an enemy. Why does he say that? Because a lot of people have taken the devil as their friend. But Allah is telling you, he's your enemy. So treat him as your enemy. Yes, brother, your question. Yeah, in that case, uh, it's so unseen to us, so right. deep and known to us. Right. How do we be able to know, able to notice or to be uh, taken awareness that they exist in, in, in our life? Through our faith and the words of our Lord, okay? And ultimately, whenever we find that uh, there's uh, that I, I seem to be suffering from some kind of insinuation in order to entice me towards sinning, I claim this is from the shaitan. This is from my arch enemy, the one who wants me to go with him to hellfire. Because in the conversation, between Allah and the shaitan, as the Quran tells us, right? The shaitan told Allah what? فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ So the shaitan swore, swore by what? By his mother? Or by his greatness? He swore by the greatness of Allah. <laughs> Can you imagine? He swore by the greatness of Allah then he will do what? It's so contradictory. That he will misguide as many people as possible. He wants to take as many people as possible with him 
to hellfire. So those insinuations that uh, maybe when you if, if you feel that uh, something that is prohibited is suddenly becoming maybe uh, pleasing to you or somehow maybe seeming less unpleasant than before, know that it is the shaitan. Doing what? Deceiving you. Making things that are horrible seem to be pleasant. In order to do what? To encourage you to do that which would invite Allah's anger instead of bringing his pleasure. Anything else? Time out? We're finished here. Can you